All right, good evening, good evening. Welcome back to White Oak Baptist Church evening service. How many are saved tonight, amen? I guess I'm the only one because no one's, there we go, we got some people saved over here. How many are saved over here on this side of the auditorium? All right, wave at me. All right, good. How's that? No, no mic, we got, yeah, we've got sound, we're good. Let's turn in our hymnals to 259, to God be the glory. We'll sing the entire song, hymn 259, and is our, as is our custom, let's all stand together. Amen, thank you. To God be the glory, great things he hath done. So His Son, who yielded His life and atonement for sin, and hope in the life gate that all may go in. Sing it now. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let the earth hear His voice. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give Him the glory, great things He hath done. Number two. Oh, perfect redemption, the purchase of blood to every believer, the promise of God, the vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Number three. Great things he has taught us, great things he hath done, and great our rejoicing through Jesus the Son. But purer and higher and greater will be our wonder, our transport, when Jesus we see. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Thankful so much for God and all he does for us and to God be the glory, amen. Amen. What a great uh, day it's been in God's house. We had two families join the church at the end of the 1045 service. And uh, one of those families, the husband and wife, were baptized. So neat to see the baptistry water stirred and great things are happening at White Oak Baptist Church. And to God be the glory. Amen. And so, so glad all of you are here tonight. If you weren't here this morning, you might be wondering what's up with all the flags hanging from the roof. Uh, we are having our vacation Bible school, and we brought in neighborhood Bible time. That's why this guy, this, this tall, handsome, slender gentleman standing right next to me, uh, he, uh, Brother Larry Kuntz, he, uh, he is the one that runs neighborhood Bible time. He, the, God has chosen him to lead that, uh, that um, uh, what do you call that? It's not a company, that, that ministry. There you go, there's the word. Ministry, and they go around sending uh, boys all over the area. Miss Lizette down here goes to Golden State Baptist College. A lot of the boys from her college are involved with that. Uh, but uh, they go all over the place, and they're uh, uh, running vacation Bible schools, and we got a, just a great program. So I got to know Brother Kuntz here. I guess it's been eight or nine years ago, and uh, we've just struck up a great friendship, and he's going to be preaching for us here in a few minutes. So thank you for being faithful to God's house. We're looking forward to a good time tonight. Let's greet one another. Lord, turn around, shake each other's hands. We'll come back seeing that chorus in just a moment.
us the sun. I heard that. Let's sing that chorus. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let the earth hear His voice. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give Him the glory. Great things He hath done. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Ask Him to give us a good service in here as well as our teenagers. Our teenagers are all upstairs, and so uh, they're up there having a good time with uh, Mr. Kyle and, uh, and Pastor Mike and Brother Kyle, our intern, and they're up there having a great time getting their week started off tonight. And we'll pray God does a great work in the lives of our teenagers. Let me just say before we pray, I believe that America can still have another revival. Amen. And I believe that revival very well could start right here in this church. And it could start with our children, with our teenagers, or it could start with one of us. And so I'm praying this week that God will do something great and mighty in the hearts of all of our teenagers, in the hearts of our children, and even in the hearts of the adults as we help and we participate and we're involved. And you might say, I can't help, I can't, I can't be here. Listen, you can bow your head and you can pray and you can ask God to do something great if uh, your work schedule doesn't allow you to be here. But uh, let's go to the Lord tonight asking God uh, to give us a good service here, also a, a good service upstairs for our teenagers as they have fun, and then hear some good, solid uh, biblical preaching. Pastor Dave, if you'd come and open the service for us in prayer. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for today. We thank you for the excitement of this week and how we're expecting you to do great things. Lord, we know that you want to see these kids, these teenagers, saved and sanctified more than we do. We pray, Lord God, we'd be willing vessels. We pray for the teens upstairs right now that you would be able to mold them more and more into your image. Pray, Lord God, for this service down here, that our hearts would be ready to hear your word, that we would be willing with our voices to lift you up and glorify you through song and through giving. And we love you, Lord Jesus. We thank you. Praise in your name. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. All right, let's take our hymnals again and turn to hymn 178. The Bible stands. We'll sing the first, second, and fourth. And when we talk about the Bible, which one do we mean? The King James Bible, there you go. All right, we might even sing uh, for one of those verses, the King James stands. How about we do that on the, on the second time through? We'll do that, all right? Can you remember that? And so the first, second, and fourth. Go ahead, Melissa. The Bible stands like a rock undaunted mid the raging storms of time. Its pages burn with the truth eternal and they glow with a life sublime. The Bible stands though the hills may tumble, it will firmly stand when the earth shall crumble. I will plant my feet on its firm foundation for the Bible stands. Hold on now. When we sing that chorus the next time, we're going to say, the King James stands, though the hills may tumble. It will firmly stand when the earth shall crumble. I will plant my feet on its firm foundation for the King James stand. All right, everybody got that? Number two. The Bible stands like a mountain towering far above the works of man. Its truth by none ever was refuted and destroy it they never can. The King James stands, though the hills may tumble, it will firmly stand when the earth shall crumble. I will plant my feet on its firm foundation for the King James stands. Number four. The Bible stands, every test we give it's for its author is divine. By grace alone I expect to live it and to prove it and make it mine. The Bible stands, though the hills may tumble, it will firmly stand when the earth shall crumble. I will plant my feet on its firm foundation for the Bible stands. Well, I have everyone on the platform go ahead and sit on the front row there. Uh, I don't see anybody visiting tonight. Do we have anyone visiting with us tonight? If you would, just slip up your hand. All right, I thought I recognized everyone that came in. Uh, at this time, we're going to take a, just a few minutes, and we're going to show you 
uh, some of the things that happened at our, on our trip to youth conference last uh, week. I have not looked at the whole slideshow, so there may be uh, a picture of me half asleep or something. If so, uh, someone's going get, to uh, get Dr. Paycheck or something. So we'll, uh, we'll see about that. But uh, no, I, I'm, I'm teasing there. But uh, we had a great time and a lot of fun. We had eight teenagers go. And we had uh, five of us adults that went, and um, uh, we uh, long drive out, long drive back. Like I say, it was every bit worth it. Got to know them a lot better, and the Lord really did a great work. And we're just excited about how this week is going to build on last week. But nonetheless, uh, for those of you that were on the fence about going and didn't go, or have young ones and uh, that are not quite of age yet, this video maybe will help show you why you should let them go when the, when the time's right uh, in, the, in the years to come. This time, we'll go ahead and, and show that.
So you can see we had a lot of fun. You might want to know why Rachel was arrested there. How many saw the picture of Rachel there? She didn't get arrested. What happened was uh, one of our teenagers, I won't say her name, but her initials are Natalie Pacheco. Um, <laughs> she was feeling really sick on the way back, and so we pulled over on the shoulder so she wouldn't throw up all over me. And she was sitting right behind me. And uh, we, we let her out of the van, and uh, she's standing there just trying to collect herself, and, and Rachel had gotten out with her. We had a police officer walk up and make sure she was okay. So Judy Harvey snapped a picture, and it looked like Rachel was getting arrested and taken <laughs> off. So it was great. But uh, we had a good time. And uh, no accidents, no tickets, praise the Lord, all the way there and back, no tickets. And a lot of uh, good decisions were made for the Lord. So we're very grateful for that. Uh, why don't we do this at this time? I don't know what's next on the order of service. I, okay, uh, we're going to have uh, Pastor Dave come up, and he's going to give us a quick bus report. I was trying to encourage everyone for Neighborhood Bible Time, trying to talk about all the flyers we've passed out. Just all week long, I don't think the day has gone by when someone hasn't called the church asking for, the, for either the bus come by or to sign them up for Neighborhood Bible Time. All the excitement starts tomorrow morning. If you're available, come on, help us out. We still need some more people to help out with registration. If you're a church member here, um, see me afterwards from 8.30 to about 9.30 for help out with the registration. It's going to be a great time. Make sure you have a part in it. You'll hear Brother Coons here in a little bit. You'll see his excitement for it. You ask the kids and how excited they got this morning. Make sure you have a part in it. Brother Verone's going to come up and lead us in a song. Come on, Brother Verone. Let's turn in our hymnals to hymn 216. Let's stand together. We'll sing the first and the fourth of God Leads Us Along. <clears throat> In shady green pastures so rich and so sweet, God leads his dear children along. Where the water's cool flow bathes the weary one's feet, God leads his dear children along. Some through the water, some through the flood, some through the fire, but all through the blood. Some through great sorrow, but God gives a song in the night season and all the day long. Number four. Away from the mire and away from the clay, God leads his dear children along. Away up in glory, eternity's day, God leads his dear children along. Some through the water, some through the flood, some through the fire, but all through the blood. Some through great sorrow, but God gives a song in the night season and all the day long. Amen. You can be seated. Ushers, you go ahead and make your way forward. Prepare to collect this evening's tithes, offerings, and faith promise giving. And uh, just remember the, all the activities that are coming up uh, this uh, coming week at the church. The big, the big push for the church uh, after the Neighborhood Bible Time is the Friday evening award ceremony at 7 o'clock. Again, if you can, come on out and help us to get to know the other people who will be uh, uh, becoming familiar with our church through this program. Be here to shake hands and just make people feel loved and welcomed. If you are a Sunday school teacher, an adult Sunday school teacher, this would be a great thing to show up. Grandparents and, and parents will be here and you can try to rope them into your Sunday school classes. That would be a phenomenal thing. That'll be at 7 o'clock this Friday. We'll uh, pray for our evening offering. We'd ask uh, Mike Kinkowski, if you would, lead us in prayer.
if you walk around the church, you've noticed there are decorations everywhere. In every classroom, they've been decorating. And as most of you know, what we had this year was instead of just having me and some volunteers just decorate, what we did was we challenged the Sunday school classes to, to take a section of the church and to decorate it out. My biggest bribe of it was the winning class. I was going to send my wife in there to cook a hot breakfast for them. I know she's talking about doing cinnamon rolls, bacon, and other, a lot of other good things. She's going to get with the teacher and, and decide, you know, decide with them what they get. So I know several people came in throughout the whole week, decorated some classes. I know we're doing it this morning. So the winning class, the class that everyone's going to be attending next week, so they want to be part of it, right? The winning class this year was... The Family Foundations class, Brother Own Sunday School class. Let's give him a round of applause. A group of judges came and they gave their opinion which was decorated the best. Oh, he's giving me a thumbs up from the back. <laughs> so next Sunday morning, my wife's going to go in there and cook a nice hot breakfast for them with all sorts of goodies. And it's going to be a great time in fellowship. Thank you for all those who came in to help decorate. I mentioned this year some of the directors look some of the best they ever have. And it's also just taking a lot of burden off of us so I can concentrate more on soul winning, which is the main thing, right? For the Romans, going to come lead us in the next song. All right. Let's take our hymnals again and turn to hymn 228. His eye is on the sparrow. We'll do the first and the last. Why should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadows come? Why should my heart be lonely and long for heaven and home when Jesus is my portion? My constant friend is he. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. Number three. I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. For his eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. Now number three. <laughs> whenever I am tempted, whenever clouds arise, when songs give place to sighing, when hope within me dies, I draw the closer to him, from care he sets me free. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he cares for me. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he cares for me. I sing because I'm happy, I sing because I'm free, for his eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. Again, much has been said this, uh, the weeks leading up and then even today about Brother Larry Koontz. And I guess the best compliment I can give him is that he's, he's been my friend uh, the last several years, and he's been my mentor. Um, everyone needs someone who's willing to put their, their finger in your face in a godly way and say, you need to change this to be a better person. And Brother Kuntz has been one of those people in my life to help me along that way. In fact, he's already told me all the things I'm doing wrong in pastoring you. And so when he leaves, you're going to have a brand new pastor, amen? I'm just teasing. Uh, but no, no, but all seriousness, he's been a friend to Angel and I, his wife Nancy, and, and he have been married many, many years and uh, have been a, a large help to us uh, in the short time we've known them. And uh, Brother Coons, I'm just thankful for you and I'm blessed uh, to call you my friend and, and to, uh, to know that, uh, uh, that uh, your life lined up with my life. 
If you're not happy that I am your pastor, you get to blame him. He's the one that submitted my name uh, to the church here. So uh, if you're happy that I'm your pastor, then you get to thank him. So hopefully it's more the latter. But uh, we're, uh, we're grateful for him and uh, excited to what God's going to speak uh, to us through him today as he opens God's word to us. Brother Kuntz, if you would, come at this time and preach to us. Okay, thank you, Pastor. Well, you know how announcements are. He said I was tall and he said I was thin. And so uh, and he said I was good looking. So I, I like that. Uh, none of those things are true, but I am thankful for them. I always thought if I was six foot eight, I'd be thin. You know, but when you're five foot eight, it is a challenge. Um, well, I'm thankful to be here. I'm thankful to be here with your pastor. He's a blessing to me, too. It's a two way street. You realize that, right? Iron sharpeneth iron. I'm so thankful that he also challenges me in many areas of my life as well. And so that's a, that's a, that's a blessing as well. Uh, how many of you are familiar with Neighborhood Bible Time? Just kind of raise your hand. Just a few of you. A few of you that were here last night. That is your experience of Neighborhood Bible Time. Uh, neighborhood Bible Time started in 1952. How many of you were alive? No, don't tell me. In 1952, but it was born in the heart of God, and it was uh, given to Charles B. Homeshire. And uh, he was a faithful servant uh, in his early 20s. He had a burden to reach boys and girls, and he just went out to some of the projects of Denver, and he began to call kids down out of the apartment complexes and preach the gospel. They called it the Hour of Truth, where they would just give one hour of biblical truth, and kids were responding. They were hungry to hear how they could know that they could have their sins forgiven and a home in heaven, and many came to know Christ as their Savior. And as he stayed there uh, for a month or two, the crowds just kept getting bigger and bigger. And Brother Homeshire, Charles B. Homeshire and his wife Peggy would say when they would go up and visit the homes or the apartments, uh, they found them to have broken furniture and empty refrigerators. And what a great need there was for the gospel. And then over time, he realized that that needed to be done in a local church. And so they began to call local churches in the Denver area and say, hey, you need to come down here because these kids are getting saved and we need to place them in a good church where they can grow then and be discipled and be baptized and begin to grow in Christ, in the Christ likeness. And so the churches started rallying around that. And the next thing you know, they started going to uh, more churches, to different states and and Brother Holmshire said, you know, um, I can either do this myself with a few people or I could go out and train others. And that's what he did. He began to go to Bible colleges and get young men that were studying for the ministry or they had a heart for God and began to train them to do what he was doing. And that was to go out and preach the gospel through the local church. So let's fast forward. So let's fast forward these 64 years. And when they first started, they had a handful of kids only God could do this, the fruit that's remained. Over 2 million boys, girls, and teenagers have attended a neighborhood Bible time youth crusade. Hundreds of thousands have been saved, and many are serving around the country. A lot of these young men that came from Bible college and, and came and spent a summer for the practical side of ministry are serving around the world as missionaries, pastor, uh, engineers, lawyers, deacons, Sunday school teachers, you name it all over. So God has really blessed the faithfulness to his word. So I entered in 15 years ago to a ministry that was already established on the firm foundation of Bible doctrine. And my wife and I have been able, by God's grace and, and just by by uh, being stu trying to be stewards, is to further it along. And over the last couple of years, we've been able to go to some other countries. We have a team in Colombia, South America, right now preaching as we speak. We have a group in the Dominican Republic. We have a group in Ireland, a group in England. And all over the world and here in the United States, there are young men uh, serving in local churches just like this, being encouraged by you to see what the ministry is like as they train to replace us one day. And that's a goal. In fact, if you just want to take your Bibles to two verses, and then we'll get into our text for tonight, go to uh, 2 Timothy uh, chapter number 3, 2 Timothy 3. And look at verse number 15. This is kind of our theme verse. And the Bible says in uh, chapter number uh, 3 of 2 Timothy, verse 15 says, and, from, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. So as, uh, as the gospel's preached, 
Uh, Christ died for all, and as, as he is lifted up, and we preach the gospel, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, young people are saved. Middle-aged people are saved. Older people are saved. The gospel has not lost any of its power. And then if you just turn back to uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, and in verse number 2 is kind of our, our theme verse for the young men that are traveling. The young men are traveling. How many of you here are uh, between the ages of 19 and 23? 19 and 23. Raise your hand really high. Good. I have 40 young men that are looking for wives. So uh, if you need, if you're looking, I'll just bring you by all 40 and you can say, mm, no, no. Oh, okay. And, uh, uh, and, and they're doing a good job and they'll be back off in college here very soon. But 2 uh, Timothy chapter 2, verse 2 says, And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. We want to teach these young men how to handle the word of God properly. Because you can handle the word of God deceitfully on accident. And we want to carefully, as we hand it off to them, and say, here you go, and they want to take off with it. And we say, whoa, 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 slow down. This is how you preach. This is how you, you give the gospel. This is how you work with people so that they can grow in their life as well and not be an offense. If the Bible offends, let it offend, but let's not offend in the flesh. That's not, let's not say what we think the Bible says. Let's go ahead and preach what the Bible says. And that is sufficient. Christ is sufficient for any of your needs. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad it was sufficient for salvation? And now it is also sufficient for your growth in Christ. That he has the answer to all the situations that you and I are facing today. Praise the Lord. I'm glad for that. So neighborhood Bible time is not something that, uh, that came from us, but I believe it was born in the heart of God. It's been powered by the Holy Spirit. And Christ is preached in every rally. Christ has preached in every rally, and many kids already this summer, I don't know how many, I just don't want to throw a number out there, but I can tell you thousands already this summer have trusted Christ as their Savior. And that's wonderful thing. And I'm looking forward to that this week. I mean, just think about it. Some little kid is sleeping now. He probably doesn't even know he's coming tomorrow. Someone's going to wake him up early in the morning and say, hey, you're supposed to be on the bus. He's going to say, what bus? And he's going to get on the bus. He's going to get, what color is it? I forget. It's red. He's going to get on a red bus, and he's going to come into here, and he's going to meet you. And as he meets you, he's going to also meet Christ. Because you're just going to be a windshield for him to see your Savior. And you're going to love him unconditionally, just as Christ loved you unconditionally. And just as Christ forgave you of your dirty sins and the guilt that you had, he's willing to forgive those kids. And just think, those of you that got saved later in life, how much time you wasted and how much sin you experienced. And here these young kids can get saved at a young age and be kept from all that sin. Be kept from that. Isn't that wonderful? They can do that. So many kids will come here this week. They will come unsaved, and they will leave saved. And those that leave, they will at least leave with the Word of God planted in their heart. And the Bible tells us in Isaiah chapter 55 that His Word will not return void. So we don't know that somewhere along the line, someone else is going to enter into their life. They're going to water that seed, and they are going to see them come to know Christ as their Savior. Isn't that, isn't that great news? And we get to see that every year. You get to see that here. And so I'm looking forward to not only seeing young boys and girls saved and teenagers, which right now are somewhere in the building or outside playing games, getting ready to hear the preaching today, that we're building relationships so that we can tell them how Christ died. Think about it. What is it that causes a teenager to commit suicide at such a young age when life is just starting out for them, saved or unsaved? What is it that causes them to fill their veins with drugs? No hope. There's no hope. They listen to the world, they listen to the voices, and everything is pounding on them, and they don't see any way out at such a young age. And drugs and alcohol and sin and impurity uh, capture their lives and brings them into slavery, and they can't get out of it. But then they hear that Christ died for them, and they can have forgiveness of sin, and many of them come to know Christ as their Savior. We've had... Young teenagers that have come that said that they were already contemplating suicide. That they had thought about it and even planned it out. One girl that got saved a few years ago, she said that she had already wrote it in her journal what day she was going to kill herself. And somebody, like you, asked them to come to a neighborhood Bible time rally. Not that it's a neighborhood Bible time rally, but they brought them to church and they got saved. And that changed her whole life. She's alive today. Because somebody cared for her soul. 
So you might not be able to come to neighborhood Bible time and serve because you have a work schedule and you have things that you have to do during the day, but you can invite somebody. So find out your neighbors and, and or you're at a gas station, take some flyers home with you and just pass them out to everybody. They're no good next week. So just pass the flyers out and say, hey, why don't you come? And uh, you'll have a great time, and the kids will too. I'm looking forward to tomorrow, even though I am getting a little bit older. I'm 50 years old, and uh, I still enjoy being around the kids. I still um, enjoy that. They wear me out by the end of the day. That's okay. You can sleep at night and get up in the morning and start all over again. So thank you for allowing us to be here. We're here to serve you. And uh, already I'm kind of fed up with the church because they fed me so well already. Every time I turn around, there's either a, a bag of cookies, and I came back here after, after we went out to eat, and I came back here and I said, well, I'm just going to do some work. In the room I went into, there was a bag of little Hershey's. That is like my favorite. I said, I'm not going to eat these. I'm just not going to do it. And guess what? After the fifth one, I said, that's it. I'm not eating any more of these things. And so I said, what are you doing to yourself? It was great, though, but um, I'll pay for it tomorrow. Well, take your Bibles, if you would, and turn to the book of Hebrews, chapter number 11. Let me ask you something. What do you, what do you think about in your mind, in your heart, when you think of the word faith? When you think of the word faith, faith is an important ingredient in all that we do. May I say it's even more than an important ingredient. In fact, before we look at our text, just turn over to Hebrews chapter number 12, and it kind of tells us how we got chapter number 11, which is a lot of times known as the Hall of Faith. I'm sure you're familiar with that, where God has placed names in there, and if you look at those people, they're no different than you and I. But why did they seem to accomplish things that are written in here? And, and, and really, is, 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 is their lives and what they did, is, is that God no longer working that way? I tell you, the, the God of the, books of the book of Acts is still alive. And he's still working through men and women today. And the great things that we read in Hebrews chapter 11 can still be taking place today. But what is that key ingredients? What is that when we think of the word of faith? So we have in chapter number 12, verse number 1, wherefore, and whenever you see the word therefore or wherefore, it's always telling you about something that has happened recently before uh, he wrote this. So he's talking about chapter number 11. He says, wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witness, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. As you know, the Christian, the Christian life is, is a marathon. It's not a sprint. So the encouragement is not that there's all these people in chapter number 11 looking over the side rails of heaven down to what we're doing. They're not doing that. They are beholding their Savior. When you get to heaven, you're not going to worry about that because there is no time. And before you know it, everyone's going to be there anyways. They are rejoicing in the very presence of the one that saved him. And, and they are before him constantly. But what it does mean here is that we have a great witness. In other words, when we read chapter 11, it ought to cause us to learn about faith, but it also also make us to lay aside every weight. To lay aside anything that hinders us from running the race, because that's what these men and women did in chapter 11. They laid aside everything that would stop them that was not necessarily sin, but it was a distraction from keeping them from accomplishing what God had for them. But it also says also the sin. Those things that creep up in our life that are allowed in there that also beset us or set us aside. And it also just teaches us to run that race with patience. Stay with it. Don't quit. You know what? It's always too early to quit. It's just always too early to quit. How many people quit before they get around the corner? I always wondered about 7-Up. I wonder who invented 1-Up, 2-Up, 3-Up, 4-Up, 5-Up, and 6-Up. Then he quit. And someone comes along with that 7-Up. Look at them. They're millionaires. Billionaires. What I'm trying to say by being ridiculous is to show you the obvious, and that is simply this. Don't quit. Stay in the race. Run it with patience. Why? Because chapter 11 gives us the answer of how we can finish our chorus, just not finish it, but finish it with joy. See, everyone's going to finish their course because we're all going to die. But few finish it with joy. 
Finish it with joy. Don't quit. Stay with it. Why? Because here's the ingredients. Let's look at our text and we'll go to prayer. Let's turn back to chapter number 11 and verse number 6. Now, a lot of times when you are preaching, you have to explain a passage because it's very difficult to understand. Sometimes you have to spend a lot of time on it, even when you're studying it, because even the person that's going to preach it doesn't quite understand it. And so you spend a lot of time just trying to figure out what in the world is that passage saying. But can I tell you something? This verse right here, you can be a first grader and understand what this is saying. Look how simple it is. It says in verse number six, but without faith, it is what? It's impossible to please him. There it is. I don't think we have to spend a lot of time on this. We don't have to try to draw a lot of illustrations. We don't have to give a lot of examples. The bottom line is this, that without faith, it's impossible to please him. So in other words, the key ingredients of all these men and women that we find in chapter number 11 was faith. The reason they finished their course, the reason they did things that we look at and say, you got to be kidding me. How did this happen? Because it was impossible. What's impossible? Well, you know, if there, sometimes you'll see a sportscaster and some guy will be running for a pass and he'll stick his arm out and, man, he'll just like be stretching all the way and he'll grab it on the very tips of his fingers and he'll bring it back in and he'll bounce off his shoulder and he'll be falling down and he'll catch it. And the sports announcer will say, that was an impossible catch. No, it was possible. He just did it. The impossible is when God intersects with your life and he does what is impossible. When he made the sun stand still for 24 hours, that's impossible. When a woman that was 90 years, how many 90-year-old women have you seen pregnant? Just raise your hand if you've seen a 90-year-old woman pregnant. If you saw a 90-year-old woman pregnant, would you say that's impossible? That was impossible with Sarah. See, that's impossible. How would you like to go to a funeral? How many of you have been to a funeral? How would you like to go to a funeral and they say the body stinks and the next thing you know you're going to lunch with the dead person? That's what happened when Christ said to Lazarus, Lazarus, come forth. That's impossible. We cannot do that. And that's what he's saying here is he's saying the reason that we look in here and we see these men and women and what they have done through faith is impossible because God intersected at the right time because they just obeyed his voice. See, by, by faith, without faith, it's impossible to please him. In fact, the Bible tells us in the book of James that Elijah was a man of like faith. He was just like you and I were. Now, we don't put skirts on like they did, but he put his skirts on the same way everyone else did back in those days. In other words, he puts his pants on the same way we do. There was nothing different with Elijah, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Peter, Esther, Sarah, anybody in the Bible that is different than you and I today. They're the same way. They're sinners saved by grace. There is no S on their shirt. There is nothing like that at all. They looked just like us. They got tired. They needed to eat. And they had bad days. Elijah had a couple of bad days. They're just like we are. What was the difference? Faith. That is the ingredients. They all were men and women of faith. In fact, may I tell you that if Elijah was sitting in here and I said, oh, he's in the fourth row back, the third person over, he would look just like you and I. You would not know any difference. Sometimes we think that these men and women did things that nobody else could do. Can I tell you that God is still doing miracles today and the impossible through men and women that are living by faith. Amen. For without faith it is what? impossible to please God. Father, thank you now. As we look at the scriptures, may we understand what you're talking about here in the area of faith. Uh, many times in the scriptures you talk about little faith, much faith, no faith. We see all kinds of faith. But Lord, one thing we know for sure from just looking at our text, it is impossible to please you without faith. Father, do a work in our heart because we need it. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. So the, our scripture text once again says, But without faith it's impossible to please, please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Faith is the requirement. Faith is not blind. Faith is in the confidence based on the character of God. The reason men and women jump, the reason men and women step out by faith, is because they believe in the character of God. God said it. 
So God will do it. I can trust him because he said he will be there for me. And so they, although they could not see the result, they could not see what would take place, they still went based on the character of God. So faith is not blind. Faith is an expected expectation, an expected hope in the character of the one that we serve. You did that by faith when you trusted Christ. He said he would save you from your sins. You trusted him, and what did he do? He saved you from your sins. If you didn't believe that he could save you from your sins, then you would be in the same lost condition that you were at when you heard the gospel. But by faith, you believed him and you put your dependence on him and he changed your life. Look at these men and women. We won't go through them all, but by faith, uh, Abel offered up unto God a more excellent sacrifice. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death. Could you imagine being out with Enoch? And all of a sudden you come home and your mom says, hey, where's Enoch? And you say, well, I don't know where he's at. He was, he was here a minute ago. Uh, where can he be? Hey, E, E, where are you? He never answered. By faith, God took him straight up into heaven. Uh, by, by faith, Noah, never seen rain before. I know you know these stories, but don't lose the wonder of it all. Here's Noah. He never saw rain. They didn't even know what rain was that would come from the skies. And he built an ark. And he had one message. It's going to rain for 120 years. By faith, Abraham. By faith, uh, Sarah. Uh, it just goes on and on and on the faith of these men and these women. And when you really get down here, you even look in verse 31... There's, there's a bunch of, we could just stay here forever, but by faith, the harlot Rahab perished not with them uh, that believed not. So here is even God giving faith even if you have a past that's pretty ugly. God chooses to remember it no more. Your sins aren't covered, they're gone. It's like the man that said, he said, I just want to ask God one question. Where are my sins? Because you're God. You have to know where they are. He says, I forgot where I put them because I chose to remember them no more. Isn't that great to know? And then we can live a life of faith. So faith, how do we get faith? Well, the Bible says, and, and you can say this verse with me if you know it, faith cometh by and hearing by the... That's exactly right. So when we read the Scriptures... We see men and women step out in faith and we read that and it encourages us. So the more we read, the stronger our faith gets in the character of God. So we say, wow, look what God did. He took 300 men to defeat 132,000 men. I mean 300 men, rather, to defeat 132,000 men in the battle with Gideon. We look at these stories and we say, it's all about God. Look what he's done. And so we believe that. And so by faith, we step out. So faith is by reading. So we need to be in the scriptures. I hope you are. I don't know what your reading habits are. I don't think that it gives you any more uh, uh, standing with God. Because when we were forgiven in our sins, past, present, and future that we have a home in heaven, we are completely justified. There's no more favor with God. We have all the favor we need, but we need growth to trust Him for more. So reading our Bible gives us one sense or one piece of the pie. So when you read your Bible, you are it's really a revelation of who God is. It's not about the people. It's about the God of the people. And so we see that, and it increases our faith. But here's really where faith really needs to be taken care of is through experience. You and I have to experience faith. In other words, we have to get out of the pew. We've got to step out by faith and prove the Lord. In other words, think about this. Because Daniel, at the age of 19, refused the king's meat, at age 90, he was able to face the lion's den. Because Abraham, at a young age, sojourned away from his family to a land where he didn't know where it was, was able at a hundred and something years old to take his son up on the mountain to slay him. Because Noah was righteous in the little things, God was able to use him for a worldwide flood. So we see here that these men and women didn't 
go into the graduate school of faith overnight. They started out with little steps of faith, and as they did, God took them deeper. He never drowned them. He strengthened them so that God could use them in a deeper way. Hey, let me ask you something. Is God using you? Are you stepping out by faith? Now, here's how we experience faith. How many of you remember your first roller coaster ride? Raise your hand if you remember it. How many of you are scared of roller coaster rides? Oh, good. Me too. I want to tell you something. I've been on a roller coaster once, maybe twice, and that's it. And the first time I was on it was because I was dating. I was dating who is now my wife, and she was all excited about roller coasters. So guess what? I had to be excited about them. So we got to Great America, and as soon as he got there, my heart was just damaged right away. My wife said, I can't wait to go on the roller coasters. I'm like, oh, you got to be kidding me. I hate roller coasters. But I was in love, and she looked at me, and she said to me, she said to me, do you like roller coasters? And I lied right through my teeth. I said, you bet. This is going to be a great day. Sure enough, we ran to that first roller coaster, and we got right there where that roller coaster was. And um, I was looking at all those signs that it says. It says, it says um, if you have a bad heart, you can't go. Well, unfortunately, I was only uh, 22 years old. My heart was okay. And then it said you had to have a good back. Well, guess what? At 22, my back was doing okay. And it said if you were pregnant, well, I know it looks like it, but I'm not pregnant. So I couldn't do that. And it said, and I'm pretty short, and it said if you aren't above a certain line, you can't go either. Well, unfortunately, I was above the line. So we got in that long line. You know that long line, right? It goes forever. I don't know who conned you into going on to your first roller coaster ride, but there's a lot of fear there, isn't there? And you start going through that line, and then they have those little movie cameras, those cameras where they show you people that are going down the ride, right? They don't look like they're happy. Do they? Does anybody look happy? I mean, you look at them, they're in complete terror. They're holding on to each other. They don't even like each other. They're hugging each other. Husbands and wives that aren't getting along are hugging like crazy. Cell phones, wallets, money are falling out everywhere. People are regurgitating. It is just completely nuts. And then, they get, and then you watch them through that, and you just watch yourself going through that line. And you keep getting closer, and the closer you get, your hands start getting wet. And they start sweating, and you get that look in your countenance. You know how your countenance changes? And uh, some people are really excited to get on, and I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. What in the world am I doing here? Do I really love her that much? Do I love her? Do I love her? Oh, I guess I do. I've got to go on this thing. And you're just going through this line. But when you get to the very, very top, you look over and you look at the guy that's running the machine. And he looks like you're like, where would you find this guy? He's got all long hair, right? It doesn't look like he's trying to guess the red is go and the... Uh, I mean, the, the green is go, and the red is stop, and he's confused, and you're like, you got to be kidding me. This guy's getting like six bucks an hour, and he's going to be having my life in his hands. There's no way I'm getting on that thing. You know, and I want to say, hey, you know what? I need to call my mom just to see if she's okay. Well, that's not going to fly, right? I'm dating her. I'm 22. I can't say that. I wanna, oh, yeah, I got to just call and check in on her. I'll be back in an hour. That isn't going to work. But there is a little exit up there. It's called the chicken exit. Now, it's not really called that. It's really for people that would really have an emergency and have to leave. And it's that last chance you have to get off. And every once in a while, you see somebody walking down it, and everybody's saying, oh, man, that guy's chicken. Oh, my goodness, look at that, scaredy cat. You can just tell. Their head's all bowed down, and they're not looking. They're feeling shameful, and they're going off that chicken exit. Well, if you go past the chicken exit, guess what? You're riding it. You're riding it. And you get on that thing, right? And all of a sudden you hear that noise. It's extra loud because you've never heard it before. And you hear click. You're like, click? What do you mean click? There's no getting off. The guy says, you're all right? Yeah, okay. And then you go. And then you hear that noise. Where did they get that noise from? I mean, why does it have to do that? And you're going up. And this is exactly what it's like, right? And you're going up it, right? And it's just like it's having trouble getting up the hill. And the front half's going down already. They're screaming like crazy. You're still chitching all the way up the top part. Next thing you know, what happens? You go. And it's like everything is lost. You're like, you got to be kidding me. You, you know, just take me home. It's all over. And down you go. And you say, ooh, I made it. And some people got their hands up like this. And you're like this. About this far from the, from the thing. And then you, you, you see other people waving their hands, and then you say, oh, I made it. 
And then you hear that noise again. There's two hills? Are you serious? So then you're going up it again. And then you go down again, and you go around. And then for most people, not for me, but for most people, you get off that roller coaster, and you get pretty pumped up, and you say to the guy, you say, that was great, let's do it again. Because why? You experienced it. You got on the roller coaster, and you had to depend on that completely. And when you got done, you said, man, that thing's pretty small. I wonder if there's a bigger roller coaster. And the next thing you know, you're chasing around the nation to get to the biggest and fastest roller coaster so that you can experience every ride. Why? Because you stepped out and got on there. But can I tell you, many of us in our walk of faith, when God is burdening our heart and moving us towards something through the preaching of God's word, and it's unmistakable, we take the chicken exit. We don't step out by faith. We take the chicken exit, and God can't take us any deeper than the faith that we experienced at the cross for salvation. See, the cross of salvation was never intended for us to stay there. It was intended for us to be saved there, but then we're to get up and walk by faith. You don't think that all these men and women in, in Hebrews chapter 11 weren't scared? Do you really don't? You think that any of these men and women right here, that they knew the outcome? Do you, do you, do you think that Noah knew for sure it was going to rain? He believed it by faith. Do you really believe all these, that these men, when, 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 when Abraham went up that mountain to slay his own son, he didn't know what was going to happen? But he knew the character of God. Why? Because he didn't take the chicken exit when he was newly saved. As God begins to work in your life, he is always working on your faith. How do I know that? Because you would have thought at 134, 38 years old that God would have given Abraham a break. He's 138. Let's give him a rest. He's been through all this faith. Why do we want to give him his hardest challenge? Because until God takes you home, he's not done with stretching your faith. But there's a tendency in Christianity to get comfortable. When's the last time you experienced God growing your faith by challenging you to step out on whatever it is? Maybe it's in your purity. You can trust Him by faith for your purity. Maybe it's your finances. You can trust Him by faith for your finances. Maybe it, is, maybe it is staying at the job where you really don't want to stay, but you know maybe that's where God wants you. You can trust Him to get you through those difficult times. Maybe it's the trial you're going through. God wants you to step out a little bit more and trust Him through all those things that you're facing right now by faith. That's where God really grows you. So there's the experience of reading other people's faith, which is encouraging, isn't it? You hear something, you say, man, wow, can you believe that? That is just incredible what God did in their life. And you get really pumped up about it. But it doesn't change yours. You have to step out. So let me tell you something. God never stops challenging you to step out by faith. So if it's been years, something's wrong. You must be taking the chicken exit. And we'll get callous to growing in our faith. And what we do is become pew setters. And God never intended that. He intended the church to be a place to gather, to be encouraged, to go out and live by faith. So God's challenging us. He's challenging us this week. Did you know that? By this week, God has laid on this church to reach people. It's a special time. It's an organized outreach. And by faith, each person here, regardless of your age or your ability, are called by faith to bring kids in. Now you say, well, I can't do that. I can't get out. I'm infirmed. That's okay. You can pray. There was one lady that could not go out, and so what she was doing was she took just the white pages in her community and began to call every home and say that there was a, there was a youth crusade going on at the church, and she wanted to invite their kids 
and their parents. And she called a lot of uh, numbers, and about five or six kids showed up from her just calling in the phone book. So all of us can participate, but do we take the chicken exit? Or do we just trust the Lord in what he's doing because his character is always right? God would never lead you to do something that he didn't plan on answering. It'd be like a doctor coming out of the hospital and seeing he's done. He's, he's been working all day. He's exhausted. He's had four or five surgeries. And he comes outside and he sees a body laying at the door. And he says, I'm just so tired. And he steps over the body and he walks away. That would be disingenuine. He would not do that. He would pick that body up and take it in. And in the same way, God would never lead you to do something by faith if he didn't plan on answering it. So what steps of faith have you taken the chicken exit on? What, what are the areas? I don't know what it is, but the Holy Spirit is able to strike your heart right now to what that is. I don't know what it is. But take that next step of faith, because as you take that next step of faith, you know what you find out? Like when you get off the roller coaster, you say, hey, this wasn't as bad as I thought it was. It wasn't as bad as I thought it was. I got a wife out of it. If I went to go on my face, she might have said, well, I'm not going to marry that chicken. I'm joking. You realize that. I hope. Oh, no. <laughs> but anyways, we want to live by faith. But let me show you something interesting in our passage, and then we're done in our text here. The reason it has to be done by faith and by the character of God, because we really don't know how it's going to turn out. We know that God's in it. And we know that his character is trustworthy, but when we read these stories, they're encouraging because every one of them that we read here that I just talked about end with a great end. We see God wrought kingdoms. We see, we see the enemy slayed. And, and we see all that in their life. But there's some ones here that have no names. Isn't that interesting? God shows the names of the ones that had great victory and gives you their names. But then there's a group we're going to look at here, starting in verse number 36, where there's no names. These are unknown people. It doesn't say, and Jane, by faith, stepped out and she was killed for her faith, but many came to Christ because of her death. There's nothing like that. Christ died on the cross, opened up salvation for all. Sometimes that happens. God sometimes creates a person for the express purpose of showing his glory to the unseen world as well as the seen world. Sometimes that's the case. So look here in verse number 36, because everything changes. It says, and others. Who are others? Maybe those are people that are living today. They say there's more martyrs in this last hundred years than there, there were like two or three hundred years prior to that. There are people that, are, uh, that have been slain in countries today, not necessarily today, because I don't know that for sure, but over the last year they have lost their heads for their faith. And we don't even know who they are. They're just, uh, they're just a name. So it's here, it's here it says, the, uh, and, then, and others, in verse number 36, had trials of cruel marking, uh, mocking and scourgings. You know what scourgings is, right? That's being beat. I uh, lost my place here, sorry. Scrooge, uh, yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. I've read the story on uh, Vinji, um, I uh, can't think of his last name right now, but a Russian man that was in jail back in the 30s, 40s, 50s, and then his son after him for having an underground church in Russia and all that they went through, uh, Vinzi George. And, uh, and, and so we go on here, so we got, they were stoned. Have you ever been hit with a stone? Have you ever been hit by someone? You ever been hit by anything? Even those little nerf things? They sting. Okay? They were stoned. It says here that they were sawed asunder. They said that he used to hollow out logs and they put the people in the logs and they cut the logs in half. So they were sawed asunder. These were men and women that stepped out by faith. They didn't take the chicken exit to do God's bidding, but God chose to use their death to open up opportunities for the gospel to be furthered. And we see that in Acts with, with Stephen. Stephen is stoned, the first deacon. He steps out by faith and he preaches righteousness. 
And the people get upset, the Jewish leaders of that day get upset, and they stone him, and they lay their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. And on the road to Damascus, God uses that in his mind as one of the tools or convictions to lead him to Christ. And most of you in here today, if you trace back your genealogy, your spiritual genealogy would probably go back to the Apostle Paul. Because he's the Apostle to the Gentiles. Most likely, if we track it back, we track back that maybe somewhere the person that led you to the Lord, that led him to the Lord, that led him to the Lord, 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 might have come all the way back to hearing Paul preach somewhere where he was saved. So God used one man's death, like Stephen, to be stoned to open up salvation for all of us because, see, the reward isn't here on earth, the reward is later. In heaven. So he goes on here and he says, They were stoned, saw the sun, they were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. And they wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and in caves of the earth. And these all, having obtained a good report through what? Faith. Faith. Received not the promise. Yes, they did. They did not receive the promise here on earth. But they received the promise, God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. In other words, that matured the body. Because of their sacrifice, willing even to the death. Did not Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego say that? Whether we die or not, we will not bow. Bow or burn. Bow or burn. They said, we'll burn. But God chose to let them live, and some of you will, will step out by faith, and God will use it, and you will see it until you're 80-something years old. You will see the results and the fruit of that. Others of you will not, but you'll see it one day. When you see how God used your life in a way by faith to open up the gospel, maybe to a whole country. Maybe to a whole country. So, let's go back to our text and let's close. And our text here is very simple. But without faith, it's what? It's impossible to please God. There it is. It's in principle form. There's the principle. We don't have to make up a principle. We don't have to give a fallen condition focus. We don't have to, we don't have to give anything. It's right there, but without faith, it is impossible to please God. And you're not going to get any credit on this side. You're not going to be in the paper. You're not going to be on the TV screen. You're not going to be one of the CNN heroes at the end of the year. None of that's going to take place. It won't be until you get there. Let me end with this illustration. There was a man coming back from overseas, and he had served in the country of Africa for almost his whole life. And he was coming back, and on the same boat that he was on it was the Kennedy father. Not Jack Kennedy, but I forget the father's name now. Does anybody remember the father's name? Joe. Joe. Joe Kennedy, coming back on there with all their sons and their daughters. There was a lot of them, 10, 11 of them. And they were coming back from England, and before World War II, they were coming back. This man had served in this country all his life, and when they got on that big old steamer to come across the pond, come across the ocean, there was a big uh, to-do about the Kennedys being on board. There was parties and bands and all kinds of things, and this man began to get bitter because he said, we've served 40 years I've buried two of my kids overseas in the ground in Africa. I have worked my fingers to the bones. I've translated a language that wasn't even translatable. And all this taken place. And I've spent all these years here and nobody even knows we exist. And he was getting very bitter about it. His wife tried to calm him down. But he was having a difficult time rationalizing that. And then when they hit the uh, New York Harbor... To, to be their final spot of coming back to the United States, there was the red carpet, there was, was all the photographers, there was all the, all the bands and everything like that, and the man stood up on the railing and he said to his wife, this is not right, this is not fair, we live the life by faith, we've done all of this, and look at this, nobody even cares. And his sweet wife, praise the Lord for sweet wives that have a sense of things better than men do, simply grabbed his hand and patted it and said, Honey, we're not home. We're not home. See, because the Kennedys were home, that's all they were going to get. It was a moment. 
we're not home. Do you remember when Stephen died, Christ stood up and welcomed him into heaven? When you die, Christ, then we're home. Then we're home. Would you stand with me? Okay, this is a challenging question, and it's not an easy question. And it, 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 it steps on toes. Where have you taken the chicken exit? The Holy Spirit never misses an opportunity to point out where we've taken the chicken exit. I'm not going to tell you all the times I've taken the chicken exit and explain them all to you, but I've taken the chicken exit many times. Many, 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 many times. I didn't go into ministry until I was 39, but I knew in, and when I was 25 God was calling me, but I kept taking the chicken exit. The chicken exit. Praise God, he's good. But he's good. So where have you taken the chicken exit? Is it in your purity? Is it in your finances? Is it in your work? Is it in your marriage? Is it with your children? Where, where's that chicken exit? Where, where is it that you knew that you should have grabbed on and by faith just trusted God in a very difficult situation, but you took the chicken exit? Or maybe you're saying, hey, I haven't done that. I did by faith. Praise the Lord. Keep doing it. So if you're not saved, get saved tonight by faith. If you are saved, maybe you need to just come here and, and, and just kind of confess to God that you've taken the chicken exit in some areas of your life and ask God to give you the faith needed to take that step of faith, whatever it is, and just trust the Lord, whatever that is. You come. As the music starts, would you listen and close your eyes and just meditate on the message and you obey the Holy Spirit? Whatever it is, whatever it is, you come. If that's the need, you come. You come. Step right out. See, don't take the chicken exit. This is the opportunity. This is the opportunity. Sit down in your pew. You don't have to come forward. Coming forward doesn't make you any more spiritual. Sit down right where you're at. Sit down right where you're at. It doesn't have to be a show up here. Sit down right where you're at. That's fine. Whatever it is. Whatever it is. You can be seated. In the Christian life, you have three groups of people. You have people who are quitters. You have people who are, um, uh, rather, you have people who, yeah, you have people who are quitters. You have people who are settlers, and you have people who are climbers. Some people quit in the valley. They quit at the foot of the cross. They get saved, and that's as far as they go. Other people, they climb a little ways, and things get tough, and they settle. I just plop down right with that and they say, this is good enough. God doesn't want you to be a settler. I'm pressing on the upward way. New heights I'm gaining every day. What God wants is a church full of people who say, okay, God, I passed that faith test. I'm ready for the next one. I'm ready for the next one. Thank you, Brother Koontz. What an excellent message this evening. And 
definitely challenged my heart. Don't take the chicken exit. We're going to be going to Six Flags this Saturday. You're going to go get on the roller coaster. No, I'm teasing. But don't take the chicken exit in life. Amen. We have a very precious decision tonight that I want to share with everyone. This is a decision that Angela and I have been waiting for our daughter to make on her own for a while. April got saved a couple of years ago. But tonight she, uh, she came to us this afternoon. She said, Dad, I am ready to get baptized. And so, April, if you'll stand. April, if you'll go on back with your mom and get ready to get baptized. We had a couple baptized this morning. I get to, get to uh, baptize my favorite young lady in the whole world in just a few minutes. Brother Brown, if you'll come and lead us in a, in a song while we get ready. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. What a good night. Let's all stand together and we'll sing. And uh, let's, let's, let's go to that faith song. I think that's good. The faith is, uh, my faith is found a resting place, 340. We'll sing that and then maybe we'll have some baptism songs. We'll see how that goes. All right. Page, uh, or I should say hymn 340. My faith has found a resting place, not in device nor creed. I trust the ever-living one, his wounds for me shall plead. I need no other argument, I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. Number two, enough for me that Jesus says this ends my fear and doubt. A sinful soul I come to him, he'll never cast me out. I need no other argument I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. Number three, my heart is leaning on the word, the written word of God. Salvation by my Savior's name, salvation through his blood. I need no other argument, I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. Number four, my great physician heals the sick, the lost he came to save. For me his precious blood he shed, for me his life he gave. I need no other argument, I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. All right, I understand they're there. Ready? All right, draw your attention to the bathroom. Stand right there. All right. This is April Lejeune. April, have you asked Jesus to come in your heart and be your Savior? Yes. Upon your public profession of faith in Him, I baptize you, my daughter and little sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, buried in the likeness of His death, raised to walk in newness of life. Hey! You can stand, and uh, what a joy that was, amen. So, uh, thank you for being here tonight. Look forward to a very good week this week. Tomorrow morning at 8.30, registration will begin. Things will get kicked off here in the auditorium at 9 o'clock. And for all of you who are going to be involved this week, uh, you're going to wear yourself out. I'm just going to ask you to come here and get as involved as you can, and uh, it'll be a good week. So. Thank you in advance for all the labor that will be put in. If you can't be here, you can pray. You can pray. And that's equally as important. Amen? And so let's pray for that this week. Brother Coons, again, thank you for the message. We're looking forward to a good week this week. Let's have a word of prayer right now, asking God to bless our week, this uh, coming up week, and uh, to give us safety on the way home. Brother Brown, if you would, lift your voice. Close us in prayer. 